Good evening. Thank you, everybody, for being here. My name is Eric Olson. Most of you know me. I've been your Commonwealth attorney for the last four years. I've been working in the Commonwealth attorney's office for the last 26 years. When Dan Chichester hired me in 1989, I was the third full-time Commonwealth attorney. There's 13 of us now. I tell that to people, and they can't believe that. And the reason, of course, is the growth that Stafford has had over those 26 years. And with growth comes good things, but of course we see the darker side and the increase of crime. But if you ask the citizens of Stafford County about that, they will tell you they feel safe. And that just doesn't happen by accident. It happens with the partnership that our office has with Sheriff Charlie Jett. A case doesn't end with an arrest, it begins with an arrest. And it happens with skill and experience and expertise, and that's what I bring to this job. The skill of prosecuting for 26 years. Being named Prosecutor of the Year by my 600 colleagues in 2008. By the experience that I've had in trying 250 jury trials. By being in court every day, every week, every month for the last 26 years, protecting the citizens of Stafford County. And the expertise that I bring that I've learned, that I've gained, and that I share with others. I'm a trainer of other prosecutors, not just across the state, but all across the country. When prosecutors need to be trained, they call on me to train them because they know the skills and the experience that I have. And when those three things come together, the skill, experience, um, and the expertise, then the criminal justice system is no longer just a revolving door. It's what it can be. It's a catalyst for change a catalyst for change to the victims that come into the criminal justice system, the defendants that come into the criminal justice system, and of course the citizens that are protected by the criminal justice system. That's what I bring, that's what I've done, and that's what I hope to continue to do. Good evening. My name is Tim Barbro. Uh, I think probably a lot of you know me, but for those who don't, I'm originally from southwest Virginia, which is uh, little town called Saltville. I moved here about 17 years ago. I've been living here since, since that time in Southern Stafford. I've been practicing law since that time. Uh, I've been, I have a varied practice of law, but with a concentration in criminal law. I've been, I've tried cases from Bristol to Arlington to Virginia Beach and all points in between. Uh, experience is a good thing, but the main ingredient, the chief characteristic, the chief trait that you want in a Commonwealth attorney is judgment. That's because a Commonwealth attorney is perhaps the most influential person in the criminal justice system. They decide they have what they call prosecutorial discretion. That discretion, that's a discretion to determine whether charges should be filed, if so, what charges should be filed, and how those charges should be pursued. I don't question Mr. Olson's experience. He has experience. But what I do question is his judgment. His judgment in his policies. His policy of asking for a jury trial in nearly every single criminal case. That's a policy that is not working in Stafford County, that is a drain on Stafford County's budget, and more importantly, has had an adverse effect on public safety. Because over the last four years, since Mr. Olson's been in office, they haven't had a good one loss record when it comes to jury trials. And I'll tell you, and one of the reasons is this policy of asking for a jury in every case. Every, you go over there on a typical day, and you folks know it, there's three to six jury trials scheduled on a particular day. There's no way his office can be prepared for three to six jury trials per day. Um, so it's the judgment that I believe I will bring to this office that's missing now. Thank you. But if you didn't see this one coming, then you're missing something. Heroin is a problem in this case. <laughs> uh, and, and, it, and, it, and I understand the levity of the context of this, but the, there is no levity in the problem with heroin. We've heard from the House of Delegates how they think they should deal with it. We heard from the sheriff candidates how they think it should be dealt with. I want to know specifically how you will deal with it in the next four years if you're elected as our Commonwealth Attorney. And the first person to answer this question is Mr. Wilson. It's not just how I would deal with it, it's how I have been dealing with it. This isn't something new, it's something that's emerged over the last two years. I met with Sheriff Charlie Jett 
18 months ago to get on top of this issue to address it. And we had a, a plan. First, a public awareness. We used forfeiture money and we put together a public awareness campaign. Because heroin addiction starts in the medicine cabinet in our homes with our kids. That's where it starts. And so that public awareness was a big part of it. It starts with the addicts. No one wakes up in the morning and says, I'm going to quit heroin today. It doesn't happen like that. There has to be a catalyst, a catalyst for change. And I found the criminal justice system can and often is that catalyst. You heard Chuck Feldbush say that his daughter had a heroin problem. She got drug court from my office. That's what we do for addicts. If they want a path to beat the addiction, we give it to them. If you are a drug dealer and you deal in this drug of death, then you're going to be treated with all the resources and the skill and the experience that we have to make sure that you no longer can destroy lives. Because by dealing this drug, you're destroying lives. I, using my forfeiture budget, contributed money to the Hope Over Heroin event. That's a faith-based or, uh, organization, faith-based event to try to get on top of this problem. That's what I've been doing about this thing. We got on top of it and we've been addressing it since it first emerged. And there are some major differences between how I would handle the substance abuse problem and the way that Mr. Olson's office has handled that problem over the last four years and the years preceding that. Up until four years ago, I think it's, first of all, I think it's a two-pronged approach. Number one is you have to be tough on dealers. You have to put dealers away. You have to be able to convict those dealers. Uh, you know, he had a, we had a prescription, a doctor in this community who was essentially operating a prescription mill, Dr. Mahanty. Many of you may remember that case. Dr. Mahanty was also charged with prescribing drugs that had led to the death of a Stafford resident. Ms. Rolson brought indictments against her. I think it was over close to 100 indictments against her, and then handed her off to the feds, and where she eventually received, I think, a prison sentence of four years. Somebody who does that kind of damage in Stafford County, which results in the death of a Stafford County resident, should be dealt with and punished in Stafford County. The second part of this equation is the... Uh, the users, and how do you handle that? Well, up until four years ago, we have, in this area, we have one of the best programs in the country. It's the drug court program. Up until four years ago, Stafford didn't participate in that at all. Under Mr. Olson, they've cracked the door, but in order to deal with this problem effectively, you've got to knock that door down. Drug court, we need to fully participate in drug court. I will. It won't be just a select number of people who get in it. I will make sure that that opportunity is available to all. Thank you. The next question is, is pretty narrow from the audience, so I'm going to broaden up both uh, for just a bit. The question specifically is, would you be willing to prosecute law enforcement when they break the laws? I'm going to expand that to, to, to include corruption across uh, county government, whether it's a supervisor, whether it's a school board <coughs> member, whether it's a county employee. Anytime we have county, you know, people put their own interests ahead of the residents, and take personal profit or gain or do damage. How will you handle that? And, uh, and what will you do to seek out and eliminate that if it exists? And the first person to answer this question will be Mr. Barber. Well, absolutely. Nobody is above the law. No, no, no member of the police department, no member of the Commonwealth Attorney's Department, no member of the Board of Supervisors. No one is above the law. Now, the question becomes, when there's an incident, how do you handle that? There's an incident involving the Sheriff's Department. Do you investigate that in-house? Do you bring in somebody from outside to take a look at it? You know, because as Commonwealth Attorney, I'll be working with you all on a day-to-day -day basis. It's difficult when you have those kind of relationships to do a fair and impartial investigation. I don't know that it's difficult to do a fair and impartial investigation, but you have to have an investigation that the public has faith in and trust. And so for those reasons, number one, yes, if there is a situation that calls for investigation or prosecution, I will absolutely go forward with that. To avoid the appearance of impropriety, I wouldn't hesitate to bring in an outside agency to investigate, such as the Virginia State Police. We're a country of laws, and there's nobody above the law. And 
Um, I will give you the answer that I've made for the last 26 years. If anybody commits a crime in Stafford County, I, my office, will be responsible for prosecuting the crime. If it's investigated, um, if the facts are there, if the evidence is there, that case will be investigated. That's been the history of this office. It's what I have brought to the office for 26 years and will continue to do. In the sheriff's office race, there was a question about the Evan, Evan Newsom case. That was investigated by the Virginia State Police, fully investigated. That investigation was turned over to me. That wasn't shoved under the rug. I produced a 15-page report that was sent out to the newspaper, published. It's available for anybody to see, detailing every single fact in that case and all the reasoning that went in to the final determination that the officers that had the unfortunate experience to have to shoot Evan Nelson did so in self-defense and with absolute legal justification. There's no sweeping under the rug of that. That is available. Contact my office, get it to you. Go on Fredericksburg.com and download that. That is what I have been doing in the time that I've been Commonwealth's attorney. Um, addressing wrongdoing and holding folks accountable when they commit a crime. And it doesn't matter whether you're a member of the Board of Supervisors or a sheriff's deputy or a citizen or a recidivist. Um, that's what's going to happen if you commit a crime here in Stafford. The uh, next question has to deal with equal opportunity. Um, many people would would say that a either a police force or Commonwealth's attorney office should, in some measure, reflect the community which it serves. I think most people would agree with that. So I want to know: A, do you agree with that? But B, I want to get beyond, like we did last night, that everyone agrees traffic is a problem. I want to know how you would address it if you believe the situation we have now is not where we should be. How do we get there? Okay, so should we have a more representative staff in the Commonwealth's attorney? And if so, how do we get there? Mr. Olson, you're first. This issue came up when I spoke to the NAACP um, last year. Um, I've had scant opportunity to hire in my office because the prosecutors in my office are career prosecutors. When we send out for applications, we are not allowed to ask on the application, what is your race? We don't know when somebody applies what somebody's race is. And I can tell you that each time we have had an opening, we assess the applications and we do the hiring based on who we believe is the best candidate for that job. But there was a suggestion made a year ago that I took to heart from the MAACP. And that's, they suggested, what can you do, Mr. Olson, to recruit persons of color to be assistant Commonwealth attorneys in your office? And I took that to heart. The National Association of Black Prosecutors has a convention every summer in Washington, D.C. A big component of that is a job fair to link employers with candidates that are seeking a job in prosecution. I sent two of my prosecutors to that job fair. We were act actively recruiting candidates for a position that has now opened up. We have career prosecutors. One of our career prosecutors ended up uh, going up to the bench and being a judge. And so we have an opening now. So that is actively what I've been doing to recruit good candidates for the job. And I'll tell you what, those applications are in, and we're going through the process now, and we will select the best candidate for that job. But at least we have a pool of applicants now that is diverse, and that gives us the opportunity to take a look at all aspects of hiring when we make that decision. Thank you. Well, absolutely. The uh, Commonwealth Attorney's Office should reflect the cultural diversity of the um, community that it serves. And it's not just about affirmative action or quotas or anything of that nature. It's about effective prosecution. You have to have the trust of the community <clears throat> In order to be an effective prosecutor, you have to be able to go out in those communities. You have to be able to talk to victims of crime. You have to be able to talk to witnesses. And you have to have that trust. You know, I, 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 in, I've been here 17 years. I've spoken to people who've been here a lot longer than I have. And in 80 years of that Commonwealth Attorney's Office, there's been one African-American prosecutor who was there for a little over around a year. And that was about, that was around, I think, 2006 and 2007. I ran on this issue hard four years ago. 
I confronted Mr. Olson at a debate sponsored by the NAACP four years ago about the lack of any African American uh, in the Commonwealth Attorney's Office, not just the prosecutors, but the staff as well. And his response was, well, what does that have to do with diversity? And he cited the fact that he had women employed in the office. Four years. We're not talking about him getting notice of this one year ago. I mean, he's known about it at least for four years ago when I brought it up to him. And there's been zero, zero progress. <coughs> The next question is about budget. Uh, we, we heard about asset forfeiture. I don't think, uh, I don't know, and many of the people don't know where your budget comes from. Does it come from the state? Does it come from the federal government? Asset forfeiture. So where does the budget come from? About how much from each? And how would you reprioritize, change, increase, or otherwise adjust that budget to meet your agenda should you be selected as Commonwealth Attorney? So budget, where's the money coming from? Where are you going to use it? Do you have more? How would you get more if you need more? And Mr. Barbara, you're first. Thank you. Well, the funding for the Commonwealth Attorney is a mixture of funding from both the state and the local government. Uh, here's some numbers that I've found out in the last, in, during the course of this election. Spotsylvania and Stafford County are, are roughly the same population, roughly the same crime rate. Uh, the jury expenses for Stafford County in 2014, the jury expenses were $300,000 compared to $17,000 for Spotsylvania. The regional, the regional jail expenses were $6.65 million for Stafford versus $4.1 million for Spotsylvania. And again, these are communities that have roughly the same, uh, roughly the same size and the, and the same crime rate. Uh, the, prosecutor's office in Stafford County, one million more than the prosecutor's office the budget is for Spotsylvania County. I will, from day one, end this policy of asking for a jury in every single criminal case. That's 300000 That's almost, that's probably 275000 we can sell, uh, save right off the bat. I'll look to alternatives to incarcerating. It costs $50,000 a year to incarcerate somebody at the Rappahannock Regional Jail. Have a daughter going to William and Mary, that's almost twice as much as what I pay in tuition there. We can look at options for non-violent, non options to incarceration for non-violent offenders. Too often Stafford, under Mr. Olson, the philosophy is to convict and incarcerate rather than to look at options. <coughs> so, uh, this is our last question, and then we'll. Oh, yeah. Mr. Barbaro is showing his ignorance because the costs for juries did not come out of the Stafford County budget. They don't come out of our budget. Um, that's paid by the Criminal Justice Fund um, in Virginia. And it's amazing that he attacks the jury system. This is a constitutional right. It's a constitutional right for any defendant or any prosecutor to ask for a jury trial. And for him to attack that constitutional right is really beyond me, because there's no better arbiter of justice than 12 citizens asked to participate in the criminal justice system in, in, in that way. There's no better arbiter. He talks about the budget. He doesn't even understand our budget. Our funding for the prosecutors and for the staff comes from the state. The comp board says it. We're three prosecutors down from that based on staffing standards. Three down of what the state said we should have that are unfunded. We're three down. And he compares us to Spotsylvania County. Spotsylvania County Prosecutor's Office makes a plea agreement in every single case. That's why he wants to be like Spotsylvania County, a plea agreement in every single case. And if there's any question about what effect that has, let me tell you this. DWI cases, we prosecute them, they don't. 20% of the cases, they reduce to reckless driving. Last year alone, we had 530 DWI cases. They had 200 DWI cases. There is a direct correlation between prosecution of DWI cases and alcohol-related fatalities. Over the last four years, there have been twice as many people have died in Spotsylvania County in alcohol-related crashes. And that is because they deal cases, they make plea agreements in every case, and they don't prosecute. We prosecute and we keep Stafford safe here in Stafford.
I kind of jumped the gun on the last question. I apologize <laughs> for both of you. The last question does deal with time and priorities. And the question was, and I'm going to expand it, what's your plan for the next four years? So my modification to that to expand it a little bit is in time phase priority over the next four years, if you're elected Commonwealth attorney, what will you accomplish? What will you change and in a time phase order? Thank you. Um, I'm not sure if I know what you mean by time phase order. You mean first, first year, or third year? Thank you for that. Um, as the Commonwealth attorney, we don't have much luxury to decide what to do. The sheriff's office investigates and makes arrests, and we prosecute the guilty. That's our main mission. There's 51 other um, responsibilities that the Commonwealth has a, a Commonwealth office attorney's office has. Um, from investing, uh, from prosecuting sewage discharge cases to ethics violations and everything in between. Our main mission is prosecuting criminal cases. I looked at our data and I found out that 80% of our crime is committed by repeat offenders. My focus has been and will continue to be focus on repeat offenders and you affect outcomes. My plan in the first year is to do justice and prosecute the guilty. My plan in the second year is to do the same, in the third year the same, in the fourth year, because that's our job. That's the job of me and the 12 other assistant Commonwealth attorneys and the 25 member staff that our office has to serve victims, to do justice, to hold offenders accountable, to do the right thing. We do it day in and day out. And I'm proud of the job that we've done, and I'll continue to do that in the first, second, third, and fourth year of my next election cycle. Thank you. Priority number one, first thing I'll do is I will end that policy of asking for juries in every criminal case. And, and you know, I may be ignorant, but taxpayer money is taxpayer money, whether it's coming from Stafford County or whether it's coming from Richmond. And Mr. Olson spends it like a drunken sailor. There seems to be no regard to taxpayer money when it comes to Mr. Olson and the spending of money. Uh, the, the, the jury system is not, it's not just a waste of money. It also clogs up the system. We have civil cases that need to have, that, that need hearings. And when you unnecessarily ask for a jury in every case, again, it sort of shuts the criminal, it shuts the court system down. It takes years to get a case heard, a personal injury case or a divorce case. It doesn't take years, but it takes months and months. And that's a result of him unnecessarily clogging it up. Nobody's talking about making plea agreements in every case. There's an option in between jury trials and and plea bargains, and that's called a bench trial. And I know if you're familiar with the system, we have three excellent judges here, one of whom, Judge Sharp, is a former prosecutor for the city of Fredericksburg. I trust those judges. I trust their instincts, and I would trust them with cases. The second priority is to create a veterans treatment document. That's a docket for our returning servicemen and women who have some type of service-related disorder. And if you can, they are involved in the criminal justice system, if you can connect their service disorder with their involvement, then you give them an opportunity to get help and treatment in exchange for avoiding convictions and incarceration. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thanks for our five questions. We'll finish with closing statements, two minutes each. And Mr. Barbaro, you're first. <laughs> I think you can see some of the differences here tonight between my philosophy and Mr. Olson's philosophy. Uh, if I were elected Commonwealth Attorney, again, what I'm looking to do is change. It's the exercise of the prosecutorial discretion. And that comes in many forms. It comes in the forms of this inane policy of asking for a jury trial in every case. It's about what trial, what cases to pursue and what cases not to pursue. Over the last, you cannot keep Stafford safe. We have excellent deputies. I've worked with these deputies over the last 16 years. I have the greatest amount of respect for them. I have a lot of respect for Mr. Olson. He's given his career to public service and I acknowledge that and I compliment that. But that doesn't mean he's above criticism. Everyone here is, is subject to criticism of their, of their duties. Uh, but I would certainly, uh, when, I, when we're talking about the exercise of prosecutorial discretion, 
Uh, you have to, you know, over the last four years, again, they've had at least two streaks, two, two winless streaks, extended winless streaks with juries. And they have some fine prosecutors in that office. Why are they losing these jury trials? Why are they losing them? Are they taking weak cases to juries? Are they ineffective? I think it's a combination of taking weak cases and just policy of asking for a jury in every case. It puts so much pressure on their office. You don't know in each individual day whether you're going to have three cases, six cases going to a jury, which case is going to go. You can't keep Stafford safe if you can't win convictions. If you like me, your prosecutor, I will, again, trust the judges here. I'll end that policy, and we'll keep Stafford safe. Uh, when I was elected four years ago, I followed um, Dan Chichester, one of the greatest prosecutors that Virginia has ever seen. Um, and I wasn't satisfied with just continuing the incredible legacy that he had established here, working with the sheriff and keeping Stafford safe. I wanted to innovate. What can I do to improve the criminal justice system, improve outcomes, improve outcomes for victims, and improve outcomes for defendants? And I've done that. I brought a courthouse dog. I wish I had a half hour to tell you about courthouse dogs. The ability of a comfort dog, a specially trained dog, to, to um, comfort a victim of trauma, a child victim, as they're going through the worst experience of their life, and then reliving it by having to testify in court. We brought that to staff. We were the first community in Virginia, first county in Virginia to do that. Ten other counties do that now. I did the Internet Safety Initiative. Free software for any parent in Stafford County that wants to monitor their children's on lives or social media, online or social media lives to protect them from online predators. I took a look at our data and I saw that recidivism was a huge problem. 80% of the crime is being committed by 20% of offenders, by repeat offenders. And we focused on those. And I took our heroin problem and said, I don't want to just sit on our hands. I want to actually do something about that. And we did something about that, and we're doing something about that. I have brought that innovation to this office. Mr. Barbara suggests that my office is just about uh, incarceration. It, that is not true. Every single day, we offer first offender status, diversion, drug court, all programs that if a first offender will get into that program and succeed, they won't have a criminal conviction. We do that every single day in my office. That innovation has kept Stafford safe, will continue to keep Stafford safe, and I just ask for your support in doing the job that I've been doing for 26 years. Thank you. For now, we're through, and I'd ask both candidates to stand and, and uh, elect.